This liberation isn't something I can help you with. I can tell you what you need to do, but you have to do it. In the beginning, teachers can help a lot. But the deeper you go, all they can do is point and clarify and tell you what you need to do. Only you can take this step. Nobody can push you into this place. It's like Buddha's final night under the Bodhi tree. What did he do when confronted with this? He reached down and touched the ground and said, I will not be moved. Finally, when everything that could be thrown at him was thrown, and he was still unmoved, it was done. He never looked back. Religion's primary function is to awaken within us the experience of the sublime and to connect us with the mystery of existence. As soon as religion forgets about its roots in the eternal, it fails in its central task. Jesus was so critical of the religion of his time because he saw that not only was it not connecting people to the mystery, but that it was actually an active participant in veiling the mystery of existence, in obscuring the kingdom of heaven. And so he was a critic from the inside, he didn't necessarily reject the religion he was brought up in, but he felt called to challenge it, to transform it. Jesus' keen insight into the potential for the corrupting influence of power in all institutions, whether they're political, economic or religious is very relevant to the modern day. If Jesus existed here and now as a human being, what he'd have to say about these subjects would be as shocking now as it was 2,000 years ago. I've talked to many people, when many of the old saints and sages say, your world is a dream. You're living in an illusion. They're referring to this world of the mind and the way we believe our thoughts about reality. When we see the world through our thoughts, we stop experiencing life as it really is and others as they really are. When I have a thought about you, that's something I've created. In a certain I've sense, turned you into if an I have idea. an idea about you that I believe, I've degraded you. I've made you into something very small. This is the way of human beings, this is what we do to each other. True meditation is the space in which everything gets revealed, everything gets seen, everything gets experienced. And as such, it lets go of itself. We don't even let go. It lets go of itself. Be an open space for whatever arises. Notice that you are the space in which everything arises. When everything is allowed to arise, you have the opportunity to perceive that which does not arise or subside. You are that. It's just natural. It's not better than or higher than anything or anybody. It's simply the natural state of being. It's totally democratic. It's the inheritance of everybody. If we are being sincere and honest with ourselves, there is an intuitive sense of what we are avoiding. If we can find the capacity to be honest, we'll start to feel in ourselves when we're being called to make effort. Who am I? Meditate on that. Seek the seeker, part of being awake is being willing to be crucified. If we think that to be awake means the whole world will agree with us, then we are in a total delusion. The ending of Jesus' life in John is completely different than in Mark. In Mark, Jesus' last breath was a loud death cry from exhaustion and torment. In the Gospel of John, Jesus right to the very end maintains his dignity and balance and remains centered in divine being. With his last breath, Jesus simply says, it is finished. Jesus has lived out his destiny, he's played his part well, and he has no regrets. But what is it? What is it like to experience blame? By questioning, what is this? Consciousness is allowed to get inside of it. So you see, there might be blame, but now it is blame that's conscious. If you try to do something with the blame, such as get rid of it, do then you are not really with it. Those belief structures are by their very nature based in unreality. Oneness is when there isn't another. Oneness is, there is only this. There is no that over there, there is only this. And that's all there is. There is only this, and as soon as you say what this is, you've just defined what it's not. This is only realized in the utter demolition of everything that it's not. Then that awakening is an awakening outside of everything that comes and goes. It is a total waking up outside of time. Okay, you want to see God? Here is God, all of God. Not just the part you want to see, but all of it. Sincere students find sincere teachers, and sincere teachers find sincere students. The two go together like a box and its lid, 
What myth carries is not fact, not history, but truth, the ultimate reality. The Jesus story carries this ultimate reality, and that's why, 2,000 years later, it remains so compelling. With a true and authentic awakening, who and what we are becomes clear. There's no longer a question about it, it is a done deal. In this way, one of the hallmarks of a true awakening is the end of seeking. You no longer feel the momentum, the push, and the pull. The seeker has been revealed as the virtual reality it always was, and as such it disappears. The seeker has in some sense accomplished its task. Enlightenment is absolute cooperation with the inevitable. Your life, all of your life, is your path to awakening. By resisting or not dealing with its challenges, you stay asleep to reality. Pay attention to what life is trying to reveal to you. Say yes to its fierce, ruthless, and loving grace. Spiritual people always think the truth is hidden from them. It is not hidden. What gets in the way is the idea of what it is going to be. Such grace is never held in abeyance, never earned or deserved. It is not given to some and not to others. Grace is ever present, it is only our openness to it. The way of liberation is a means of opening up to grace. As I delved deeper into these Christian mystics, I was beginning to question in my own mind if I needed to make a path change from Zen Buddhism to Christianity. It had been many years since I'd been to my first Catholic Mass, and I decided to go back a second time. This is how I love you, and this is how you shall love all beings and all things. A good ritual is meant to evoke the mystery of being, the mystery of our own existence, the mystery of life, the mystery of God. It's meant to evoke that sense of eternity that shines through the latticework of time and space. That's really what ritual is for, to put us in touch with that sense of eternity. With the sense of the sacred. Spirit never asks itself, how do I stay within myself? That would be ridiculous. It just makes no sense, coming from the true nature of things. What makes more sense is to ask how you unenlighten yourself. What is still held on to? What is still confusing? What situations in life can get you to believe things that aren't true and cause you to go into contradiction, suffering, and separation? What is it specifically that has the power to entice consciousness back into the gravitational field of the dream state? We should not ask, how do I stay awake? As I listened to this priest, all the presence and mystery disappeared from the room and everything returned to the relative world. It's not your ego that realizes it's God, but your true essence. It might be more accurate to say God within you realizes it's God, the radiance realizes that you are the radiance. Who really wants to find out that we're all addicted to qualities like approval, recognition, control, and power, and that none of these things actually brings an end to suffering? In fact, they're the cause of suffering. So the truth is that most of us don't really want to wake up. We, we don't really, really want to, want to manage suffering. our suffering, to have a little bit less of it, so that we can just go on with our lives as they are, unchanged, the way we want to live them, maybe feeling a little better about them. 